This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode of the show, and I am very, very pleased to bring you a chat with the great Ken Mary, the percussive maestro from Alice Cooper and Fifth Angel. He's been in a heap of other bands, and he's done so many sessions, it's, it'll take me forever and a day. Maybe not that long, but it'll take me a while to list all of his accomplishments. Suffice to say, he is one of the greatest drummers in rock and metal history. Don't take my word for it. Have a listen to all of the things that Ken has done throughout the conversation. Now, the catalyst for this chat is due to the launch of a new album from Fifth Angel. It's another banger. It is titled When Angels Kill. And I have a tune from that album to share with you, but only if you are listening via the podcast apps. This one's called Resist the Tyrant, rather appropriate for 2023, I must say. You good people on YouTube, you know the drill, I can't play music, so we're going to dive into the chat right now. Either way, let's go. Here he is. Why, hello. Ken, how's things, mate? Hello. Can you hear me? So far, so good. How about you? I, I can. Can you hear me Okay. Perfectly. Yeah. Doing Thanks, well. Man. Yeah, doing well. I've been looking forward to the possibility of this chat ever since I heard the third secret, I must say, mate. So uh, it's a pleasure to finally meet you. Oh, thank you so much. How have you found the calls have been going this time around in support of the new album? I think very good. I, I think, uh, you know, I, I think we're in kind of a little bit of a weird season where it seems like everybody and their brother released an album at the same time. <laughs> it's the COVID aftermath but, of COVID. Yep. I guess. I mean, it just seems like there's, you know, a lot of releases out there. But, you know, so far, I mean, all the calls have been going very, very well. And um, one thing that I was impressed about is, you know, a lot of the interviewers are telling me, hey, this is our, my favorite Fifth Angel album, which is to me amazing because, you know, you're fighting nostalgia on the older albums. You know, like it's hard. It's hard to fight nostalgia. And usually when you're introduced to a band, you always like the first albums that you heard from that band that, that sure. introduced you to it. You know, for me, you know, like whether it's Iron Maiden or Judas Priest, my favorite albums are always the older records. So to have some people, actually a fair number of people tell me that, I was just like, wow, that's, that's very, um, I'm very glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, true. And I'm glad they're paying attention. But I must, I must say, I haven't lived with When Angels Kill for long enough yet to really make a, a thorough appraisal outside of the fact that I enjoy it. I think it's great, but I've got to say, I've got to go back in time a little bit. I still listen to the third secret. I think what, what you guys oh, did there and yeah. And I, I mentioned this to John when I had a chat to him whenever it was released 2017 or 18 now, five or six years ago. Can you believe? But, um, a lot yeah. of legacy, a lot of legacy acts come out of the woodwork and they release things and then they, kind of go away. And I'm really grateful you guys haven't done that. You followed up. But the strength of the third secret, mate, I mean, it was one of the albums of two th the year 2018, wasn't it? It was one of the albums of 2018. So I just wanted to give you that feedback. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I felt like we did a great record as well. But, you know, no matter what you do, there's going to be some people that go, well, it wasn't Ted, you know, singing or this or that. And, and, uh, but yeah, we were, we were surprised that the response was as positive as it was, you know, because we were, we, we were very nervous about Third Secret, to be honest with you. Like w there was a lot of stress because we knew that the first two albums were considered classics and we didn't want to put something out that we didn't feel was as strong. So uh, we did wait till we felt like we had something special. And then when we did put it out, I mean, it seemed like people were really into it. So yeah, I mean, I think that was great. Uh, and then hopefully they, they feel as strong as this. I mean, it's always our goal to make something that's going to stand the test of time, you know, because here we are you know, 35 years later or whatever, talking about those other albums. <laughs> and, you know, we, we want to shoot for that in every record that we make. Mm. Yeah, you raise an important point there. I actually don't, you guys don't feel like a legacy act. You feel like a new band, okay? Given the strength of the third secret and now what you're doing here with the new album, it feels like as though it's not a second coming. It's just here you are and you've gone with Nuclear Blast and they have all of the young hot things on there as well, on the label there as well. But 
you guys are matching it beat for beat, note for note with some of the deathcore bands, some of the metalcore bands. And I remember now that I'm talking about it, I remember talking about this aspect of it with, of your music with, um, with John. So when you're thinking about touring and performing, are you thinking about, Hey, let's look at some legacy packages or are you actually thinking, hang on, we've got the chops to match it with the younger bands. We're going to go down this route. Well, I, I think for us, you know, we're really just trying to get the word out to as many people as we can. We're not really thinking in terms of what type of bands we want to play with. We're just looking for the best opportunities to share music with people. So, you know, whatever that might be. I mean, I think for us, probably, honestly, you know, like, you know, I've done a lot of uh, different festivals over the last, you know, five years. And I do think that, you know, you do want to be paired, I think, with music that everybody, you know, somewhat similar style. I think we could certainly hang with the younger bands, no problem. But I do think, uh, you know, if we're if we're paired with bands that are maybe a little more melodic, you know, maybe a Halloween or a Hammerfall or, you know, something something in those areas, I think it's going to probably be better for us. I'm probably asking a question revolving around my own music taste. So there's nothing for me to listen to say Carnifex and then switch you guys on. But I know a lot of listeners don't want that. And I know a lot of promoters don't necessarily think that way. I just think you're, you are the one legacy band and there's a lot out there. Let's face it, that could actually do it if the opportunity sure. presented itself. And that's, that's my point around all of that. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. That's really, you know, it's a, and very kind of you to say that. And, you know, that's what we're always shooting for. We're always trying to be excellent no matter what it is, whether it's the artwork, whether it's a photo, whether it's a song, you know, whatever it is, we're trying to do everything with absolute excellence. So, you know, the fact that you're noticing that is is uh, very encouraging to us. Mm. Yeah, cool. Yep. Now, when angels kill, what were the, what were the more significant challenges? Okay, so you came back, you did... The third secret, I've already mentioned what a stunning album that one there is. But did you feel the sophomore response, you know, the sophomore pressure, if you like? I know it's your fourth album, but you know what I mean? There's been such a gap between the 80s and now. Did you feel that pressure to sure. deliver for people who really loved what you were doing with third, uh, the third secret? I, I don't know. I, I don't think we – no, I don't think we felt as much pressure on this one as we did on third secret. I think this one we kind of felt like, you know, we we – we were very happy with what, and, and that's all you can really do as an artist is make an album that you really feel passionate about yourself. And then I always say this in interviews, but, you know, then hopefully you find, you know, seven, eight million people that agree with you or something, you know, uh, but, but as far as, uh, you know, that pressure, you know, we, we just wanted to make ourselves happy and, and we really did. I mean, I think we all feel very strongly about the record and we feel very happy with you know what was produced so you know so i think for us um you know we we uh we we that was what we followed you know we tried to to do something that we loved and so i i would say yeah i don't i don't think we felt the pressure i mean obviously you want to make something amazing that stands the test of time that your fans will love but in this in this instance, it was kind of cool that we did a concept record and we wove together all of the previous records, all the mm -hmm. themes and even some of the lyrics and song titles we wove into this album. There's all kinds of Easter eggs for fans like you, you know, that loved the earlier albums. You're going to find all kinds of little Easter eggs in this album. And I think you're going to really love it. Um, and then the songs, you know, I, I think the songs are killer. The one thing that we haven't given up on uh, on any of the records is we always try to make songs that people can sing along with and when we played the kit festival in germany it was awesome we you know thousands and thousands of people are singing the words you know the choruses of every song even the new mm. ones and uh you know that just shows us you know for us that's we're on the right track you know i mean for for what fifth angel is you know that, that's exactly what we need to be yeah, yeah. You, you brought up the concept there, and I, I couldn't help but feel as though, and I could be well off the track here, so correct me, but, you know, we're, we're living in an era of uh, this extreme left-wing totalitarianism, you know, this this idea that we have narrative as opposed to fact, and I feel like as though you were, you were addressing some of those things through the concept in the album. Is that the case? <laughs> well, it certainly wasn't the intention. I mean, originally when we were, when we were cre starting to create this album, we were thinking – that we're telling a story that's 
way in the future. You know, it's going to be, you know, years and years and, you know, maybe 50 years or 100 years. But then you did see some very aggressive governmental tactics during COVID uh, that really did kind of give us, uh, you know, I guess a chance to pause and go, you know, what's going on here? So oddly enough, it's it's kind of weird, but the album actually almost seems like something that now is is relative to today almost yeah. uh you know, you talk about totalitarianism and you talk about government overreach and you talk about you know um you know we really did see the birth of a i mean think about this i mean i i don't like to say this because you know i'm not talking about politics i don't care what side you're on right left we've never seen something in his in human history before and this was something where we saw all the governments of the world do exactly the same thing yeah. at exactly the same time. Everybody's locked down. Everybody's doing this. We're all doing this. Everybody's getting vaxxed. Everybody's, you know, all of the different things that they implemented, the entire world did it. And so I kind of look at that and go, is that the birth of a global government? I mean, I don't know. Is it? I mean, certainly looks like it. I mean, I, I, so after that happened, you know, we were in the middle of writing this and I was like, wow, I, I didn't realize we were writing such a, an applicable record to be honest with you. We, we had no idea until, you know, once COVID hit, we were like, wow, this, you know, this is very, very applicable to today. Yeah. I, I was listening, uh, as I say, I've listened to the album a little bit, maybe a dozen times or so, but I was really focusing on the lyrics on a couple of those listens. And I was like, Jesus, you guys have, you're either soothsayers, you've got a crystal ball there somewhere and you've written it before COVID or you've written it through COVID and you've decided to weave it through this really interesting narrative you got. And I think that's, I actually think for other bands, that's the right way to address a lot of these topics because everybody knows you've got the political bands, the Rage Against the Machines and stuff who come out there and except they're not sure. saying, you know, don't do what you tell me or whatever they fucking sing. They're saying, do what the government tells you. That's literally what Tom Morello and those guys are saying now, which is just bizarre. But I, I think a way through yeah, is... Yeah, you go. I, I thought that, I thought that was the weirdest thing in the world. Like, <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, first of all, we never have gotten political. I mean, if you look at back, you know, and you and you look at the story that was woven on this record, it was really pulled from things that we were talking about, like when we were teenagers. And you know, if you go back and you listen to the uh, the third, actually, third secret was the first album we actually started thinking about. Maybe we'll we'll create a concept record, and we were talking about doing it on third secret. Because we noticed that a lot of the themes that we talked about on the first two albums, um, you know, things like uh, deception in media and terrorism and um, betrayal and war and all these different things that we were talking about, <coughs> excuse me, were still, you know, 100 percent completely applicable. So, you know, yeah, I don't know if I'd want to say like we're soothsayers or anything, but it's just weird that the things we were talking about, you know, 35 years ago are still very <laughs> applicable today you know i mean it's i guess it's a sad state of affairs of, of mankind that you know all of these things we talked about are still problems now and uh so i guess in that sense um you know yeah i mean we you know we don't have a crystal ball or anything but but i guess if you if you think of worst case scenario wow this is weird i'm i'm getting a low battery message are you there still yeah gotcha i can see and hear you yep no worries <laughs> Um, if this fails, I, I'm at I'm at my studio right now. Um, I can go home and and plug in and and continue from there uh, if that's possible. It's but it's a ways no, away, so I don't know what you're. Oh, but yeah, no, it's I'm, 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 it's. If this dies. Um, I, I will be able to to click that link and get back with you in probably 35, 40 minutes. So if that works, um, I'll I'll do that. Um, so did that answer that question? Yeah, it, it does. It's just we we living such a strange period in history. I get that there's always been a tendency for totalitarianism for and for people in leadership positions. Well, democratic, they, they become democratically elected, but then they entrench themselves in power and they surround themselves with unelected officials that become their foot soldiers. And I, some of that's definitely through your lyrics on the new album. I can hear that, but it's it's the well, fucking, excuse me, it's the lemmings well, though, isn't it? The lemmings, the people who well, go along with this stuff. Well, this is what I think. I mean, I think that uh, for the first time in history, we're kind of seeing that there's, you know, like in the United States, we're supposed to have two parties. We don't. It's like there's there's one party and, 
you know, and, and if you're a citizen and you're not in the government, you're not part of the party, <laughs> you know, it's like, we're going to hold a party, but you're not invited. So, you know, I mean, I'm not anti-government per se, but, you know, I've always had a certain suspicion, you know, of the government. And so have bands like Pink Floyd, you know, the, the wall, you know, very, mm-hmm. which ironically is a very leftist record. Uh, you know, they were, you know, very uh, suspicious of the government and concerned about what the government is doing. And, you know, it's it's ironic to me that, you know, you have some bands that now all of a sudden it's 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 OK. You know, like it, it just seems bizarre. Music has always been an outlet where where people were able to express themselves artistically. And I do feel like that stifled a great deal. I mean, you know, I will say this, you know, we ne- we never get political. We are not a political band. Um, you know, this is a story we're talking about good and evil and and all those concepts that we just talked about, you know, terrorism and war and, and betrayal and love and, you know, things going wrong and natural disasters. I mean, that's those are the kind of things nuclear war. I mean, we've always talked about this kind of stuff, so it's not anything new. But um, certainly, you know, I, I think if you have your eyes open, you, you know, you should be questioning things. You should be looking at what's going on around you and asking questions and not just taking everything as gospel and like, you know, the, that, you know, your best interests are always going to be held at heart. Cause you know, I, I honestly am not really seeing that. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a very odd era in that the most subversive thing that you can be publicly is Christian conservative and still living within a nuclear family. That's subversive <laughs> in 2023. It's so bizarre. <laughs> yeah. It was only 10 years ago when that was considered the norm. Yeah, I, well, it, it is odd. I mean, it's it's a very odd thing that, you know, that that's a threat to somebody, too. I mean, I, I'm always of the mindset, you know, you live and you let other people live. And uh, there definitely seems to be some, you know, there's a faction of people out there that in my mind, if, you know, they've lost their bearings, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't even know what, they don't even know what they want at this point. Uh, but, but yeah, when you talk, when you talk about freedom versus totalitarianism, you know, I think we can all, you know, almost all of us agree that, you know, hey, freedom is better. You know, it's better to be free. I certainly hope we can all agree on that. If we can't, then we're going to have real problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think we're going to enter into, is your federal election, is it this year or is it next year? But either way, that's when silly season really kicks in. Yeah, it's 2024. And, uh, you know, I, I I don't have any faith in, in any of that anymore. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. And I'm not... I'm not saying I'm older and cynical, but, you know, when you're young, you have a certain belief in the, the, in yeah. the system. You know, you have a certain belief in the system and that it's working well for everybody and everything. It's like, I don't have that. I'm not, I'm, I don't necessarily, I'm not saying it's all wrong, but there's definitely things that are wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah. It, it is the musicians, though, that are helping us through this period here. And, and you've been doing it as long as anybody. I mean, your your roll call, your session work is – I'm I'm disappointed, not not when I say this, keep, you know, take it with a grain of salt, I'm disappointed in your behalf. You're not more of a household name in the metal community, to be frank, because you've, you've worked with so many great musicians and I can actually tell you're drumming at this point because I've gone back and I've listened to a lot of your stuff after I, I listened to um, The Third Secret. So – at this point, you could do almost anything, I think, and, and you're in your studio there. So what's the, what's the motivating factor behind keeping this rig on the road, this beast that is Fifth Angel? Well, to, to be honest with you, yeah, the only reason to do it at this point is for the art, artistic integrity of the music. I mean, that's the only reason I'm doing it. You know, I'm doing it because I love music. I enjoy music. Uh, I, I appreciate the fans that have supported me over all these years and supported the bands that I've worked with. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like if you're an artist, you make art, you know, and so that's what we're doing. And in a very difficult environment in terms of musically, you know, let's face it, streaming has killed royalties. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to make a living as a musician these days. You know, that's why you have everybody in like 10 different bands, you know, trying to make a living. And, uh, you know, at this point, you know, the re- the main reason for me to do it is just the artistic artistic integrity and the enjoyment of making music and, and making music that inspires me and, and hopefully inspires other people. You may have told this story elsewhere, but I haven't heard it. How did you hook up with Alice way back in the day? 
Uh, actually, I have talked about this story a little bit. I was touring in Los Angeles playing a very famous venue called the Whiskey A Go Go with an artist named Randy Hansen, who does a Hendrix impersonation. And by the way, he's still out there touring today, do, you know, touring Europe. I mean, doing probably better now than he has in, in years and years. But I was playing the Whiskey A Go Go and some people that were working with Alice's management company came out to the show and they saw me play and they said, hey, hey, would you like to audition for Alice Cooper. And I was like, yeah, of course I would. And I was a kid at the time and, you know, they, I, I lived in Seattle. And so I was like, well, are you guys going to fly me down? And, uh, and they're like, well, no, we're not, we're not flying anybody down, but if you want to have an audition slot and they auditioned people for like three days and I don't know how many, uh, you know, a lot of players went down there. And so, you know, I, I threw my dime. I spent $300 on a flight or maybe it was three fifty at the time, which is a lot when you're young and, you, you know, you don't really have the money. I didn't really have the money back then, but I threw my dime, took my chance and went down and auditioned. And, you know, the next thing I knew I was playing, you know, Joe Lewis Arena sold out two nights, 22,000 people broadcast live on MTV with, in front of 20 million more. And, you know, I was a pig in slop. I mean, I was, you know, having the time of my life. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's how it happened. And it was quick, you know, I mean, we, you know, I went from, from, you know, playing the biggest place I played was like 3000 seats. to all of a sudden I was playing Coliseums and, and uh, you know, yeah, what a, what a great time, what a great era to play in and what a great time that was for us. Did you work with Kip on that album? Is that correct? Kip Winger? Yeah. Yeah. On uh, raise your fist and yell. Yeah. That was Kip playing bass. That was uh, Kane Roberts on guitar, uh, who ironically, uh, Kane Roberts is a graphics artist and he did some AI imagery for us for our second video, uh, uh resist the tyrant. And, uh, the AI imagery in there was actually created by Kane Roberts. So I think that's kind of a funny tie in to your, to your question, but yeah, that was Kip, uh, Kane, uh, Paul Taylor, uh, myself, and Alice Cooper, of course. What happened with, because that's a hell of a rhythm section, what happened with Trash then? Did he decide he just wanted to go in a different direction? Well, I actually, uh, you know, people ask me, like, well, why did you, you know, leave the Alice Cooper camp? And, you know, uh, if you look back, they had a couple people within their organization, to be honest with you, that were maybe not the right people to have in the organization that made you feel like, Hey, don't, you know, don't think of this as home, you know, don't think of the, don't think of this yeah. as something, you know, this is a gig and, you know, that's it. And, you know, if you want to do something, you're going to have to do it on your own kind of mentality. And so, you know, I joined House of Lords, which was on RCA and Gene Simmons from Kiss was involved in, in uh, executive producing that. And um, so that's, that, that's basically what I went to do. And uh, Trash came out after that. And, you know, the album did really well. Ironically, the tours that we had done were much, much bigger than the tours, the, the tour that went on for Trash. So, really? you know, it's just a it's just a weird thing. You know, you never know what's going on in the music business. But, you know, those those tours that, that we did with Alice, uh, you know, those were his huge comeback tours and they were monster tours. And still to this day, I think maybe the second biggest tours of, of Alice's career, aside from the the original band in like the 70s like 72 73 i think they were playing like los angeles coliseum and crazy stuff like that but mm -hmm. aside from that i think these were these were they were massive tours and a lot of fun to be on i have very fond memories of that with the exception of a couple of people within the organization that ironically are gone and mm -hmm. since those people have been gone they've been able to keep a consistent band for quite a number of years now so um, anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in. It's not Alice and it's not Shep, you know, they were always great. And if I had, you know, if I wasn't so young, I might've maybe asked Shep, Hey, is this really the case? You know, as far as, you know, what, the, what I'm being told, but you know, when you're young, you, you think everybody in the organization knows what they're talking about and you just assume that they're correct. So, but anyway, that's uh that's that story. <laughs> that's so true about youth, isn't it? You get fed a bunch of bullshit by assholes that are trying to make themselves more integral to an organization when really they're not adding any value whatsoever. Well, I think in in its in a sense they they uh degrad they degraded the value. Like I think they, you know, they tried to make the band feel more like they were, you know, what weren't important when in actuality in that era the band was extremely important and I think that the energy and aggression that we brought to the table, I think, you know, definitely was a shot in the arm, you know, for 
for that uh, for Alice and for the organization. You know, I think uh, I think it was important that that the what was put together was the right thing at the right time, and I think we were definitely the right thing at the right time. Mm. Did you have anything to do with Hey Stupid and The Last Temptation? I did not. No, I was I was out, out of the band at that point. Mm. And also I'm I'm pulling up my my Zoom just to see if it's actually working on my other phones cuz this looks like mine's going to die in just a minute. Sure. So uh, if that happens, um I'm going to try and connect here and if that doesn't work, I'll I'll go home and uh and plug in and connect. But uh, if I lose you, I, you know, give me like, like a minute and I should be able to click back in. Sure thing. No worries. Yeah. Are you on the East coast or the West coast? Oh, you're in Seattle. You're mentioning. Well, I'm actually in Phoenix. Um, I, I, fifth angel from Seattle. We're all, you know, we were all, we all grew up in Seattle and we were a Seattle band and uh, we came up in the same era that uh, Queensryche and Metal Church and Air Apparent and Q5. I'm trying to think of who else was kicking around. You know, that is, uh, TKO was there, too. I played in TKO for a little while. So, yeah, it was a very good metal scene up in Seattle back in the day. That's before all the grunge stuff hit. Chris Tagamo is one of the finest guitarists of any era. Did you know him? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I remember when uh, they had just they were re- just finished recording their EP and they were talking about I, I think I saw it was Chris DeGarmo. I'm not sure who the other band member was, but I saw them at Lake Sammamish in, in Washington State. And they were talking about how they had just finished this EP and they put in their own money and, you know, they were excited about it. But they felt like, you know, hey, we're, you know, we're we're taking a chance. We're using our own money. And, and Chris said, well, it's just money. You know, and, uh, and I thought that was a great attitude. And sure enough, that EP came out. And next thing I knew, I was hearing it on KISW in Seattle and they're playing Queen of the Reich. And I thought it was like a new Judas Priest album or something like I, mm. I was like, who the heck is this? This is incredible. And uh, and it was uh, it was Queen's Reich. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I haven't listened to them since when I say I enjoy all the stuff with Chris on it. Michael's another great guitarist as well, but it just doesn't have the same vibe for my for my taste. But you also, with the grunge thing, I mean, you're not that old, let's face it. So a lot of these guys like Chris Cornell, are your age? Yeah, I, I could have absolutely um, gone into the grunge thing. Um, I thought it was, you know, to be honest with you, I didn't, I didn't like a lot of the attitude, you know, like even the grunge bands were making fun of other bands. Yeah, and I no. thought that was, uh, you know, there's there's footage of, uh, you know, Alice in Change, you know, making fun of Megadeth and stuff. And I, I look at that and yeah. I go, you know, that was not cool because, you know, the, the bands they were making fun of, like Kiss and Aerosmith and Ozzy, you know, Ozzy, they wouldn't allow to join the, uh, a tour, you know, the, the grunge tour or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, uh, you know, yeah. said, yeah. I said, well, I'm going to do my own. I'm going to do Ozfest, and Ozfest was hugely successful. So, you know, they thought they were too too cool for school, and it didn't last very long. The whole grunge era. So, I mean, I, I think there's some great songs and some great bands, um, but you know, if you look at what it kind of wiped out, there was no reason for that to happen. I mean, I, I don't think the the bands or the fans had to have that kind of an attitude, and it was just an unfortunate time in history, and it really did hurt bands like fifth angel and even bands mm. like, uh, uh, I think it, it hurt Metallica. I mean, if you look at the nineties for bands like Megadeth, Metallica, Aerosmith, I mean, those were rough, those are rough a- a times for all of, all of the, you know, what you would consider, I don't know, maybe classic rock or whatever, but, um, it w- it was a difficult time for a lot of bands. Yeah. I know. I know for you guys, I mean, I was, I was too young back then to be into it, but, uh, it, looking back, was it the grunge thing that really put a stop to you guys with the third album coming out in 1990 or 91? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it, you know, had there been some interest, I mean, the difference, and I've talked about this in other interviews, but the difference was, you know, now if you lost your record deal, you could still put out videos on YouTube. You could put out songs on Spotify. You can do pretty much, you know, anything, you can still keep in contact with your fans. But back then, if you didn't have a record deal, you couldn't get records in the stores, you couldn't get anything on radio. There was no way for anybody to actually hear what you were doing. You were essentially silenced. And we did lose our deal. And once we lost our deal, you know, that's made it very difficult to continue in any, in any, in any way. 
I, I couldn't understand the attitude either. Even as a young fella, I was Kurt Cobain was one of the big, biggest junkies around in the music music industry at the time. Yet he was heaping shit on bloody Motley Crue for doing the same thing. And and since then, how many of those guys have died through drug overdoses? Lane Staley, he had a chronic issue. Scott Weiland too. I'm not not heaping shit on these people. I'm simply saying their attitude was not well founded and it was ill directed. And Forgive me for saying this. There's a bit of karma there, I think, in that most of these glam guys, they're still around, with the exception of maybe J- Johnny Lane and maybe one or two others. Most of them are still around, still putting out great music. Look at Kip. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's that's the whole thing. I think, well, you know, I don't, you know, I wouldn't call it karma per se, but I, I just think that, you know, they lived a very hard lifestyle, the grunge guys, and a lot of them were doing serious drugs and, you know, that's what happens. If you're going to do drugs, you're going to either clean up or you're going to die. I mean, those are your two choices and a lot of them died. And, and, uh, you know, that era lasted, you know, what, two, maybe three years. And then it was pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. And so it's unfortunate what, what happened to other music in that era, but, you know, it's, it is what happened and it was unfortunate for a lot of, you know, a huge number of bands. I mean, even bands like Judas Priest. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, um, Rob Halford, you know, went and did fight for a while and, you know, like everybody was trying to find something to do. And, and, uh, you know, it was, it was a bad time for probably about, you know, I don't, I'm going to say like a good six, seven years. So, mm. um, and, and, and then there's still some backlash, you know, for, from some areas, but, you know, like for, for a band like fifth angel, you know, Europe has always been a strong supporter. They didn't really get that far into the whole grunge scene and, and, um, you know, so there there are pockets of support certainly, and uh, um, you know that's really what matters now is you know hey who who loves your music and who's going to support you. Mm. I, I can tell you from firsthand experience talking to the musicians that Germany, Central and Eastern Europe, it's like the grunge thing didn't happen. They still they loved yeah. Fifth Angel and the, the the bands from that era all the way through. They were just waiting for you guys to come back, or, or so it seems. Well, we would have known, I think maybe we could have continued, you know, maybe putting out product or something. We really didn't even know till around 2010 uh, when we played the Kit Festival. Um, and I'll give a shout out to Oliver here because he's kind of responsible, you know, for in a sense for Fifth Angel t- f- reforming. Uh, but once we played that festival and saw the response, you know, that was our first inkling that, hey, you know, maybe there still is a market for this band and maybe there's still you know, uh, a desire on people's part to hear this music still. So, yeah, and that was already, you know, but it took us a long time to get from there to the third secret because we were so, you know, we wanted to do music that sounded like Fifth Angel. And when we were starting to write, it's it was good. It was good music, but it didn't sound anything like Fifth Angel. And that was a that was a real problem initially. And it took us some years to get that figured out. Do you and John do the majority of the writing? On this album, the majority of the writing was myself, uh, Ed, uh, Steve Conley, John, I'd say, uh, and Ethan actually uh, co-wrote a couple songs. So there was actually maybe more of us involved this time than perhaps the last time. Last time was largely uh, myself, Kendall, and John on the last one. And this one uh, definitely is a little more expansive and I think it helped. I think it made a better record. Um, I, I and like myself, like I, I enjoy this record. You know, I love third secret. I think third secret is a brilliant album. Love it. Um, but I do like this one a little bit more. It's like, like to me, there's more depth and there's more, maybe a little more variety. And, and I feel like the songs are stronger. Like, I feel like we made some stronger songs. Um, so uh, I do think that the additional writing, the, you know, like bringing, uh, you know, some more people into the mix, I think, I, in my opinion, I think it really helped. Mm. Just just talking about <clears throat> your session work again, can what, what's the most, what's the biggest opportunity that you've, I'm sure there's been a few, but what do you think the biggest opportunities you've thought, no, I won't do that, I'll pass on that? What would that be? The biggest opportunity that I, did you say that I passed on? Yeah, because I, I assume you had a lot of managers calling you even recently asking if you can do some gigs. Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a funny question, because uh, at one point I was playing on so many records. You know, this is back in an era before Pro Tools when you couldn't fix the drums. You know, I would get calls from all kinds of producers back then because 
I could play to a click. I could play with feel. I could play behind the click. I could play ahead of the click. And a lot of drummers couldn't do that, you know, and, and, or if they played to a click, they didn't play with feel and you couldn't fix the drums back then. So uh, I don't really think I passed up on much. I mean, I, I tried to play on as many records as I could, you know, obviously if you were, if I was gone on tour, I couldn't, but as far as things that I passed up that I wished I would have done, I really don't have, uh, there's nothing I can think of, um, in, in, off the top of my head that, that was something I wished I would have done that I, that I passed on. I, I was, had a good chat to Michael Beanhorn, Beinhorn, sorry, I think his name is about this, but he did that whole album, you know, Courtney Love, her band. And, uh, I think he brought in Dean Castronovo to do the drums on that album. And then it became, I think it, it just got out, but I think the original plan, I could be wrong, was to just have Dean come in, do the drums and say it was this other chick who did it. You strike me as a guy who, <laughs> uh, you hear these rumours, right? I mean, what's his name? The Toto guitarist, yep. Steve Lukather has talked about it, but you strike me as the guy that probably did some work on a Green Day album or something like that, totally uncredited. Is that Has that ever happened? <laughs> Well, I have ghosted on a couple things, but I, you know, yeah, I, I can't it. really talk. I knew you'd be I one of those guys. <laughs> I knew it. Well, back in the day, before, I will say this: when before Pro Tools, uh, you know, because I did, you know, I, I really trained myself with with the click tracks and you know being able to to manipulate around the click with and retain feel and and play with different feels on the click. Um, you know, I did play on a lot of things, uh, but, you know, now with Pro Tools, you know, you, you, if you have a player that's a, a fairly good player, you can you can uh, edit and you can make them sound however you want to make them sound. You can make them play behind the beat, on the beat, whatever. Uh, but, yeah, there was more of a demand uh, for me before Pro Tools. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I just knew it. Without knowing for a fact, I just knew you'd be one of those guys where producers call you in at sort of two minutes to midnight and say, it's not working, Ken, fix it. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, were they? Can you give us a hint? Were they, without naming any names, were they really prominent artists, like top 40 artists, some of them? Uh, no, I mean, I don't think there's anything. There's nothing like what you're talking about, like Green Day or something like that. But, you know, I... When you do that, you know, you have to be honoring to the fact that you were, you know, hired to do the job and you were hired to ghost and, you know, you have to, you must remain a ghost. <laughs> I, I know. And I've, look, I've, I hear the, I hear the stories off the record, believe me, and I know I'm sworn to secrecy too. Um, but uh, there's a lot of it that bloody it still goes on, I think, because you mentioned something in there. I'm a muso too, obviously. Uh, feel. If you don't have feel, you lose the groove. And and I've played with a lot of people who they can I hear the notes, but I can't feel a goddamn thing when I'm playing on stage next to them. And it's an awful gig. And and I know producers in the know like Michael, who, who excuse my language, does not fuck around, just wants someone to do the job. Um, I'm a, we're a bit like that too. It, it, you know, that's why Andy Johns. You know, Andy Johns used to fire drummers all the time, famous guys. I think he fired Kazi Powell at one point and, mm. you know, it's like, and, and he, and he, and I know, you know, people thought he was insane. You know, they're like, well, are you, why are you firing these, these drummers? But I know what he was looking for. He engineered Bonham and Bonham for his time was a, you know, he was a very solid drummer for that era. Um, that's before click tracks and everything. And, you know, uh, Andy Johns would sit at the board and he'd do this thing with his wrist. He'd go, Yes, you know he want, wanted to hear that snare just a little bit behind the the beat, and I was able to do that. So he loved me, you know, uh, just because I had, you know, I was trained and I and I knew how to do that. But you know, if I wasn't able to do that, you know, he would have fired me too. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I think the thing to do as a as a drummer or as a session musician is you always want to have as many skills in your, in your bag of tricks as possible and be really good at what you do. And if you do, you know, I mean, at least in that era, you know, people would call you and, and have you play on things. I mean, I think that, you know, the difference now is with technology, you know, it's just like singers and auto tune, you know, you can have a singer that maybe isn't a great singer. You can have a guy that, you know, I've worked with some artists where, you know, the singer had great tone, had great emotion, but his pitch was not good, but the, I can fix pitch. And, uh, you know, the guy comes out sounding like, you know, one of the greatest singers in the world, you know, uh, because he's deficient exactly where I can fix him. So, you know, being a producer has definitely, you know, you learn, you learn that, you know, in today's day and age, you know, the, the most important thing is songwriting 
and then emotion. You know, if like if you're a singer and you have the feel and the emotion, you know, that's something you cannot fix in Pro Tools. You know, and, and drumming, I think the parts and the energy, you know, that's something too that you really can't fix in Pro Tools. You know, the the actual um, cutting of the track. And if the track has good, you know, we used to say that on third secret, you know, the track has life in it, you know, like we'd finish a song and we go, this track is alive, you know, and that's the whole thing. If you can make tracks that are alive, you know, then you, then you won the game. I agree with everything you've said. Yeah. No, nowhere near, near the, I've done nowhere near the session work you've done, but I've done a bit of it. And uh, yeah, you can feel it. You can feel the energy draining out of your body when you're trying to keep up with the drum loop or a uh, particularly, I've got to say, guitarists. Guitarists are shocking for rhythm. Uh, bass players probably are too, but given I'm a bassist, I, I don't do guitar gigs. Well, I do occasionally, but not often. But I've just found that with guitarists, there's a lot of, in, in Australia, ACDC, as you can probably appreciate, are just worshipped. But the problem with ACDC is you, you probably understand this. They play in front of the beat. Now that doesn't work. It's a, just a fraction, but it's down, 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 down. You know that thing that they do, um, and that suspended chord thing that they've got going on, and that's all you know, jagged sort of Malcolm Young shit. And I can't stand them, to be quite frank with you. And the reason I can't stand them is because the amount of guitarists that turn up and have that style. But it's it just gives well, me I'm a headache. <laughs> Here, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I, I mean, growing up, I loved those guys. You know, ACDC was awesome. And uh, I still love, I mean, some of those classic albums, you know, Back in Black. I mean, what a record. I mean, you know, still today, I mean, it just every song's amazing. It's almost like that first Van Halen album, you know, like, you know, I mean, for me, I, I, I'm sorry to hear you don't like ACDC, but, you know, I understand. I mean, you know, that's why there's different bands that do different things and have different sounds and, and, uh, you know, you can't like everybody, but, uh, I, I was, uh, I was, a, <laughs> I lo- I really did dig ACDC. So, uh, anyway, yeah. I, I understand. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes I'll, I'll play a gig and, you know, there'll be a whole hoary old rock goat in the crowd and he'll come up and say, oh, it's pretty good. And then we'll get talking over a bevy or two and you go, oh, yeah, I used to, before ACDC made it big time and they had Mark Evans singing or one of the, the, the bloke with the Evans surname singing, I think, uh, not Mark, but the other guy, Dave Evans, that's it. Uh, oh, yeah, he, he, I did sound for them back in the day in Sydney, this sort of thing. And uh, I'd say, what were they like? And he says, oh, did, you, you didn't know they were going to be big so I didn't even remember what they sounded like. I just remembered doing it, this sort of thing. So, yeah, they're, they're, they've got, there's definitely a bit of a, a Kevin Bacon thing going on. Is it five degrees of separation or something like that with ACDC and the Australian music scene? So, <laughs> But, um, yeah, look, I'll, I'll make this my last question for you, okay, because I'm just mindful of your time. Um, if, if you had any advice and you are going to charge money for it, what would it be? Wow, that's really a great question. If I, if I lose this, I'll click in on my phone and, and we'll talk. Um, I think uh, advice for what? Somebody that wants to be in the music industry? Uh, look, you're a pretty experienced guy, I think, in all facets. So you you choose, but I think music industry yeah, as an aspect of answering that question would be great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're trying to succeed, I mean, I think that a you have to kind of shut off your logical brain because if you're if you're logical, you're going to look at the music industry and go like, what? What? There's like 50 million bands. There's no money in it. You know, like, what's the point of even doing it? You know, like, like if that's your logical brain, so you have to decide. You know, I think I think you have to listen to I do think you have to listen to your heart and you and and look at it and go, is this something I can live without or I can't live without? For me personally, uh, music has been such an enormous part of my life, you know, almost my entire life that I really can't imagine uh, doing anything else. Like even even if it's, you know, like I'm like what I'm doing now, I'm doing mostly for enjoyment, you know, and for the fans that, that appreciate what we do, I'm doing it for, for them too. But, you know, mostly for myself in terms of, you know, I love music. I love producing. I love writing. Uh, I like, re- I love recording, you know, I, I love drumming. I love, you know, singing. I love playing keys. I love, you know, all of these things, you know, I love every bit of it. So, you know, if you feel like you can do something else, um, and, and, and it's not going to bother you, I would probably recommend that. Like if you, if you're not, if you don't love music, probably don't get into it. Cause it's a really rough, rough and tumble, 
you know, just like ACDC said, it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. You know, oh, it's, it's like true. it's 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 true. a rough, rough business with a lot of potholes and a lot of not cool people. And so, um, you know, if you love it, though, and, and, and it's and you have to do it, it's like breathing to you, then you know, then follow that and, and do the best you can and, and make something that you're excited about. You know, like sometimes I produce bands and, and, you know, I'll be working with somebody and they go, well, we don't really like this song. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, time out, time out. What you don't like the song, but we're putting it on a record. Like if you don't like it, why would anybody else like it? Like if you're the artist and you don't like the song, you know, don't put it on your record. You know, you should love every song that's on your record. And I think if everybody did that and they made a rule of that, uh, I think I think the industry would probably be a lot better off. You know, I think you'd have better albums because I, I think people do put on songs that they don't really care for. And and I think that that's just, you know, kind of a waste. Yeah, so that would like be my advice. Yeah. Great you can do something yeah. else. Here's my my money advice. If you can do something else and and love that, um, go do it. You know, music is is not the you know, it's not the the pot of gold that it used to be, um, you know, back in the day. So you have to really love it. If you really love it, then you know what, give it a shot, make, make it happen. Mm. Did you come from a supportive environment? In other words, were your parents supportive of what you're doing or were they saying to you, listen, Ken, maybe you should go to uni and become an engineer instead. Well, you know, my, I was, uh, I was raised by a single mom. Uh, you know, I, I think later on I had a stepdad, uh, when I was, uh, just about entering my teens. And um, my mother was extremely supportive. You know, I can tell you, we grew up poor. Um, she came from Lithuania. She couldn't speak English when she got here. Uh, she, you know, I'm the first generation that was born in this country. Um, and we did grow up very poor. Uh, and I remember when I was young and I wanted to play drums, uh, my mom saved up $150 and bought me a red sparkle drum kit. And, you know, for us, for our family, that was a lot of money to spend on that. And that was after I had been playing snare drum alone, like just on a pad and drumsticks. I was just using a practice pad and drumsticks for about a year, year and a half. And when she saw that I, this is something I really wanted to do, you know, she, she went ahead and got that, you know, it wasn't a very good drum kit, but, but it was a drum kit. And I learned how to play on that drum kit and, you know, my mom was the most supportive ever because, she, you know, she was not able to follow her dream uh, of being an artist a lot. You know, in her lifetime, she had to worry about raising kids on her own. My dad left when I was five. And so so there was a lot of pressure on her and she did not um, have the ability to follow her dreams. And she wanted to make sure that we were able to follow our dreams. So, yeah, she was very supportive and that definitely helped. My stepdad, eh, probably not as much. <laughs> I mean, he, he wasn't really against it. I mean, he certainly, uh, you know, he was a he was an avid hunter and fisherman. And, you know, he always wanted to take me hunting and fishing and I wanted to, you know, jam with my buddy so he he didn't understand that at all but you know he 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 didn't try to stop me either so um you know i i would say yeah it was a it was a fairly supportive environment and i had some success fairly young you know decent i would say you know back in those days you know you could play you know my 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 the fifth angel is my high school band and we used to play i mean we had a truck we had a crew we had a pa we had a lighting system you know we had a all this stuff that we were able to buy just from playing gigs. So, you know, it was a different era, but, you know, I, I feel like I, you know, even, even then, you know, we had a certain level of success happening. And um, I, I, so I think that that support, you know, definitely grew over time just because, you know, for my mother, you know, she could see things happening, you know, she could see things going in the right direction. And I think that, that, uh, you know, but her support never, never was uh it never waned i mean it was always she was always super supportive great sounds like a lovely lady yeah she was awesome i mean to be honest with you yeah my my mother i think for everything you know i mean she really was you know fan just phenomenal and she did that not just with me but she did that with my uh sisters as well you know one of my sisters wanted to take ballet lessons she found the money to to get them to take ballet lessons we never wanted for anything even though we were Again, we you know we were not uh, we were not in good shape financially. We were later on. Later on, we we definitely were in much better shape. But when we were growing up, 
it was it was kind of tough. And um, my mother always found the money for us to explore our talents and dreams. And that's mm. that's something I will never forget. No, awesome. Yeah. Actually, I'll make this my final question for you. A bloke like you, mate, you've got to write a book. When's the autobiography coming out? <laughs> well, Andrew, how many people do you think would really be interested in that? Just to look, do you, do you, do you, I mean, do you think <laughs> like, what, what do you think? How, how many people would, would be getting my book? <laughs> well, I write, I write books. Okay. So I write, I, I've written, I've ghostwritten books and stuff. And, uh, Look, in my experience with it, it all depends on the marketing that's behind it. But if you, if it was, I think you've all answered the question in some ways already, which is that don't do it unless you really want to do it, unless it's something that you really feel comfortable yeah. doing. Because yeah, there's not a massive payoff at the end of it because people want these bloody awful Instagram reels and stuff and 30 second bites or someone falling off a scooter or something at the end of it. But yeah. uh, <laughs> look, I, I think, you know what I think it is though? I think it's an important artifact. So I think it's, and it's not about a summary of your career. It's just, the story to this day, to this time. And there just aren't enough of them out there. And look, can you have such a wonderful story to share people share with people? And yeah, it might only sell a few hundred or thousand copies, or a thousand copies or whatever, but I don't actually believe that's the point. I believe that it's an artifact of your career to this day. And it's a bit like your music, it's always there. Yeah, I, I've thought about it. And, and, you know, the nice thing about it now is it's almost like music. You know, if you're a musician, you can, you can, uh, you can get pro tools, make your own record, whatever, you know, and, and almost anybody can have a record. Now you can put it out on, you know, videos out on YouTube. You can put things on Instagram. You know, it's kind of cool. I mean, in that regard and, and writing a book is the same way now. I mean, you know, you, it's very, there's, there's not a lot of barriers to writing a book and actually marketing a book. So, you know, if I have time, you know, between, uh, you know, I mean, coming up in the future, I, I think that's a nice idea. I would like to, I mean, I really would. I would love to write a book. Um, you know, it would just be a function of time. You know, if I have the time to write a book, I, I would love to do it. And I guess, you know, maybe it's discipline. Maybe it's just writing, you know, a page or two every day. You know, maybe that's the thing. A friend of mine told me that. He goes, you know what? You need to write a book. He's, I've, I've had three or four people tell me that. And I was like, well, you know, maybe maybe I'll have to do that and just take like you know, a little bit of the morning and just write, you know, a page or a page or two every day or something, you know, yeah. Then, in a, uh, you know, in a year you'd have a, you know, 360 page book. <laughs> yeah. You, you pick, my advice would be to pick the moments in your life that you want to share, write about them first. Don't worry about chronology because you can always organize that later. You can always do a bit yep. of a skeleton diagram from top to bottom if you like, but just write about the most important things. And before you know it, mate, you find you've got sort of 20, 30,000 words. And then the rest of the story sort of combines to give you 50. You really want at least 50,000 words for it to be a, something substantial for you. Nothing like, you know, my first book was almost and How many, how many pages uh, roughly is 50,000 words? Oh, uh, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, to be honest with you, because I do, I work in Word. Um, hang on. Since you've asked the question, let me go and get my book. Hang on. Where is it? Yeah, my first one was a bit too big, but I just did it anyway. Um, 400. So that was almost 100,000 words, that one. Um, wow. But, yeah, that I had a lot to share, so I just thought I'd do it. I had the time, to your point. Um, I don't have the time now, which is why I'm struggling to do the follow-up, which I promised people, but... Um, Oh, uh, you know, to your point. I mean, you got you got Draft to Digital, which is a self publishing platform. Uh, it goes out to Amazon, which if you're on Amazon, you're in the game, as you know, like being on YouTube. And um, I just paid a copy editor to go through it to make sure my grammar was correct. Uh, you know, two grand or something like that. So, I mean, it's all things considered. I mean, it's a labor of love. So you just go, okay, that's how much it costs. It is. It's and, a labor of love. Well, you know, honestly, the, this Fifth Angel album was a labor of love. You know, like our budget compared to what we produced. You know, it's it's not it's not the same thing. <laughs> you know, we we did a double vinyl album. We weren't expecting to do that. Yeah. It just kind of happened that way. And and uh, so yeah, sometimes it is a labor of love. But like you said, it's something that's left there forever. You know, somebody can appreciate the art. You know, forever I, I, until the ready. asteroid hits at least, <laughs> or, or until we're all <laughs> locked up and you know the 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 man in your um grand overlord there and through your narrative. In your album, there starts controlling yeah, until, us, which until, I don't think until is AI us. kills us all. I guess. I guess until AI does away with all of us. <laughs> yeah, but the, you know how I think of it, honest, because I've got kids. Is um, my grandkids are going to, if they have kids, obviously, like grandkids. But 
um, if they Google me or whatever the equivalent is in sort of 100 years' time, what are they going to see? And I actually want them to see there's something productive there. There's not just selfies and bullshit. There's actually something substantial. There's conversations with people like you. And that's that's really – I think that's important, and I think it's important – to start thinking about legacy, you're lucky you've already got one, but a lot of people don't think in that way. They just think about the moment. And so they're really, their, their existence, you can still live in the moment, but you can also create a legacy, which is, which is music is really good at being able to do that. So that's how I'm thinking. And, you know, you've got this, this wonderful output. I mean, your, your name is going to be around for, for decades, hundreds of years, potentially. I mean, this, this is the reality now with, with the technology we've got these days is that you're going to be able to find out who, did the drumming on an Alice Cooper album from 1987 and 200 years time. And you can go back and there will be an AI equivalent of your drum style by that stage. Well, and I know it's actually amazing when you think about what's going to be in the future, but yeah, I, I agree with you. If I have time, I, I would love to write a book. And and again, maybe it's just discipline and I need to just start doing it, but thanks. Thank you for the advice as far as, you know, don't worry about the chronology and, and just get into it and just start writing, you know, that's, that's, I'm sure that's, you know, it's just like making an album, just get in and start, start writing songs, you know? Yeah. The, the one criticism I've got about just about all rock and metal biographies <laughs> is that they spend an inordinate amount of time on their childhood. And the only comment I've got about that is that how is that relevant to the rest of the story? And I've just listened to Geezer Butler's audio book and he did the same thing and it's relevant to a point, but it's, uh, they take almost – Keith Richards was the worst. His book spent almost a quarter of it talking about London. Okay, wow. thank you for that, Keith, but I don't give a shit, to be honest with you. If I want to read about London, I'll go to Wikipedia or, or go there. Um, you know, you want to read – I mean, these are guys that led the most debaucherous existence of anybody almost in rock and metal history, and he's barely alive. I don't know how, I don't know how he's the one that survived and outliving Lemmy and David Bowie. Well, what's, <laughs> we, what's weird is my wife, my wife and I – saw uh the rolling stones play at cardinal stadium in phoenix in i think it was 2000 and i don't know i'm gonna say like seven or eight or something and you know great show but we were convinced that keith richards was gonna die at that show like we were <laughs> i i told my wife i go i go just look at him like he's not gonna make it through the show like and then he he disappeared backstage i don't know if he was getting oxygen or whatever but he did some costume changes and stuff and i was like you know, I, I didn't think he was going to survive back then. So I, I like this one article I, or this one meme I saw on Facebook and it said, um, we need to start thinking about what kind of world we're leaving for Keith Richards. He used to have Lemmy in it too. <laughs> what, what, what we're going to leave for Lemmy and Keith Richards. Yeah. Uh, look, Le Lemmy, the, I think what undid Lemmy uh, was that he still drank Coca-Cola. So that caused him to have uh, type two diabetes. I think I could be wrong, but I think that's what happened there. But but Keith only stopped doing speed a couple of years ago. Well, I, I toured with you know uh, Lemmy uh, Motorhead opened for Alice Cooper on our European run for I don't uh, know it was like maybe a month and a half or two months, and uh, yeah, we got to know those guys. They were they were cool guys, but they were I tell you what, man, they were road dogs. I mean they <laughs> they lived they they. They were they were rough and tumble, man. I I, I call it the Lemmy shower. I le this is where I learned the Lemmy shower. You can actually take a shower in a sink. You can actually you know do do this and you can right. do that and wash your hair oh, and God. stuff. And you know I, I there's a couple times I saw that and it's like you know those guys loved being on the road, man. It was like you know whatever it took, they were gonna make it happen. And uh, you know you uh, nothing you know respect. You know what I mean? Like I have respect for those guys. The stories I've heard from younger musicians, uh, one Swedish, uh, the guy from y Jock or Yoke, I can't remember his surname now, but he's in Hardcore Superstar, told me a story and Lemmy purposefully got him blind drunk on a tour bus <laughs> and he had to be carried <laughs> off. <laughs> so he's, Dick Lemmy could just put sinking back, as you know. This this guy's a young fella and he could probably only drink half a bottle by himself before he was passed out, but Lemmy pushed him well beyond his limits and I think he almost need to have his stomach pumped after that. So, yeah, you're right about him being a road dog. It was all – there was nothing fake about it, was there? No. Well, I'll tell you a funny story. You know who the real partiers are in the music business? Tell cheap me. Trick. Back in the back in the day, Cheap Trick. Yeah. Um, the uh Lanny Cordola was the guitar player in House of Lords on the first album. And uh he thought he was gonna he goes, Hey, hey guys, I'm gonna go, you know, I'm gonna go hang out on the cheap trick bus for you know a week or whatever, you know, because they were partying back there. 
And in about two days, he came back with his tail between his legs and he said, I can't keep up with them. They don't stop. They never stop. They don't sleep. They're just partying like the entire time. And so I just thought that was the funniest thing. People always thought in that era that it was like, you know, Motley Crue or Guns N' Roses or whoever. No, nah, the real partiers were cheap trick, man. <laughs> it's always the ones you least expect, isn't it? I, I didn't, I had no inkling of that. That's the first time I've heard that about those guys. And there's not even a hint of it, is there, that they'd be like that? No, not at all. I mean, we were, you know, we were all kind of like, wow. And and the weird thing is, is they were so great every night. You know, like we were young and we had to like, you know, get sleep and take care of ourselves and stuff. And, you know, those guys were were much older at the time and and uh, just killing it every night and, <laughs> you know, and partying like nonstop. And you're just going like, how are they doing this? I I, I don't have any idea. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what that's what Gee, Gee, uh, in Geezer's biography, Bill Ward doesn't come off the best. Not that there's any uh, lurid stories about him or what have you, but um, he was an alcoholic, as you might be True. aware, and uh, it, it affected him terribly. Um, that's that's why they couldn't have him back, even when he I don't even know whether he's sober, but when he wanted to come back in the last decade or so, because he, as you bloody well know, drums can be hard. Yet alone when you're hungover. Oh, absolutely, or, or, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you know uh, the two toughest. Uh, positions are vocals and drums and uh, you know if you're going to be a vocalist or you're going to be a drummer and you're going to do a lot of drugs or drink you know it's probably not not going to end well um and you know the the old axiom is true if you have a problem you know like let's say you're an alcoholic or you're a drug addict and so that's a problem for you uh there's only two ways out you know clean up or die you know like that's that's mm -hmm. your two those are your two choices so you know, I guess I'll, I guess I'll leave you with that thought, Andrew. But I will tell you, I'm very impressed with um, what you're doing in your interviews too. I I did go and and listen to some of those, and and oh, thank uh, you. you know, great great job you're doing. Very uh, thoughtful. You know, very. Um, you know, you obviously put time into coming up with questions that are very good questions, and uh, I, I I really appreciated the interview interview. Thanks very much, brother. Yeah, I mean, as I said, you were one of those guys who'd been on my radar for a long time. Guys like you and Joe, Joey Vera are my favorite musicians. You know, Joey Vera. Well, thank and, you so much. That's that's so kind of you. Thank yeah. you. No, because you know why? Because you're doing it and you can do it in almost any circumstance or an environment. I actually take a lot of – that's where I actually take my inspiration from as a musician because I play with a lot of people. And when I think about you and Joey, how many different bands you've been in and – did the difficult circumstances you probably performed under and had to do sessions under and stuff like that. I think it's been done. So do it. This sort of, that's my attitude. Well, that's funny. Cause that's what inspired me. You know, in the nineties, I was having really a lot of trouble with my back and I would do a session. I would get up and I could barely walk and I had to go through physical therapy and find a new drum stool that actually moves and all these different things. But I figured out how to get around it. But one of the things that inspired me was a video of buddy rich, he was like, I think, 63 or 64, and he was playing the Dominican Republic with Frank Sinatra. And he he walks out there and, you know, he looks like an old guy and, you know, he sits down and you think he's going to suck. You know, you go like, yes, how good is this going to be? And he just rips your face off for like five minutes, you know, doing a solo, mm -hmm. just shredding and just killing, you know, just crushing everybody, you know. And, and I'm just like, when I saw that, I was like. You know, I'm sure there's parts of him that hurt. I'm sure not everything is perfect, you know, whatever. But this guy is not letting anything stop him and he's going out there. And, and that inspired me to like really kind of get back in and, and start fighting again. Cause you know, that, that was, that was something, you know, that was something seeing that video testimony of, of, uh, of buddy. And, um, anyway, yeah, I hope I can, I hope I can inspire others, you know, hopefully that will inspire other people. I think you do. I think you do, mate. Yeah, and you do it un unknowingly, of course. You know, we've never met before, but different continents, this sort of thing. But that's what happens. That's what life is like. And, yeah, look, I, look, I really appreciate the chat too, uh, mate. It's been a wonderful conversation. Um, I hope to see you guys down here sometime soon. That would be great. We certainly would love to come come down there, and uh, hopefully there will be enough uh, enough people to to make that happen. That would be fantastic. I mean, you're in a beautiful country. You know, it's like, are you by the beach at all? Yep. Yeah, yeah, like Northern Gold Coast. So I'm in subtropics here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, we we live. Uh, we've must, got a, must be must be great, right? 
It's in my experience, it's basically the same as Hawaii, just a tiny bit colder. Because I've been to Hawaii a couple of times, and you sort of people go, oh, "What's it like there?" And I said, "Shit, it just looks like here." To be honest with you, it doesn't even feel like I'm on holiday. Well, so. it's funny that you mentioned that because Hawaii is like my favorite place on the earth. Is Hawaii? I love Hawaii. Love that place. Um, yeah, I so do if, too. It's, if it's yeah. like if. If it's like Hawaii, maybe I need to move to Australia then. <laughs> Come to Queensland, brother. There's a lot of Americans. I went to uni with a lot of people from the United States and a lot come over and they don't leave. They don't leave because it's virtually, you know, the 95% of it is the same and there's 5% that's really different, but you'll find that. But same culture, you know, Anglo-Celtic culture. It's all the same. When I say all the yeah. same in a, in a positive way, same system of liberal democracy and and people are virtually you know, leading the same life, you know, two cars, dog in the backyard, that sort of thing. And love our freedom here or some states don't or some people don't but you know <laughs> but no mate if you can come yeah. out i think you'd i think you'd enjoy it and i know john i spoke to john about this last time because he's a scuba diver so heaps of that going on here too so yeah just i hope it happens mate i'd be i'd be one of the first people to buy a ticket put it that way awesome well thanks so much andrew you have a great it's morning there right yeah yeah just gone six past 11 now yeah well you have a great uh, rest of your day and uh I'm looking, I'll look forward to talking to you soon. Absolutely. Hope to see you down here, brother. No worries. Thanks very much again. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. There he is, ladies and gentlemen, the great Ken Mary. I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation. The reason I do this podcast is because I get an opportunity to talk to guys like Joey Vera and Ken Mary, just then a great example. Now, if you enjoyed that conversation, go and check out the many more that are available at scarsandguitars.com. And if you like listening, maybe you like reading, I'm sure you do, go across to a marketplace of your choice after you've clicked the link in the banner on the website and you can download a sample. And if you do complete the purchase of my book, Scars and Guitars, Conversations from the World of Heavy Metal, Hard Rock and Beyond, Volume 1, please do hit me up because I want to thank you in person and there's some more information to share with you about the book in the moment. Before we go to that, I'm going to bid you a fond farewell. My name is Andrew Mackay-Smith and I host the show, Scars and Guitars. Until next time, it is a very goodbye for now. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all, I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal, and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Super Joint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, Playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Borgir write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing, complete piece of shit in there. I, I, I I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldiner. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was, very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into 
having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for, for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five and Manson gave me that name and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book. <laughs>